Now, I'm not a guy who lives in the past. Indeed, I embrace the present with some enthusiasm. I love my electric toothbrush. I like my personal computer. Where would I be without Nurse McKenzie's patent electronic virility accelerator? Having said that, is there a heart so base that doesn't flutter, nay, thunder at the mere sight, sound, and smell of these beauties and break a little in the certain knowledge that we will never see their like again? From the look of them, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the development of the steam locomotive was driven purely by aesthetic judgment, possibly with some old vicar at the helm giving his thoughts on the pitch of the whistle. But it was not so. The heyday of steam was possibly the most dynamic period in the history of engineering, and those lovely old engines were driven by hard cash as much as coal. And it all started so very innocent. Of course, it was a slower pace of life in those days. It would have to be. You can't just leap onto a steam-driven boat, start her up and whiz off. There's a good hour's work before you get steam up and away. But hey, people didn't have neighbors to watch today. <laughs> oh, listen to that. Yes, sirree, Bob. It'll be only hours before we're away. At the time when James Watt realised that more could be done with steam than boiling a kettle and making a cup of tea, the only power available was horsepower, muscle power and wind power. Inefficient, very footery and not very dependable. Crossing the big oceans in those days was very time consuming and very frightening a lot of the time. However, with a rapidly expanding empire, the scene was set for steam to just go steaming in and clean up. into steam, which is basically a gas, comes through the little piston, turns the shaft, makes the propeller go round. It was in 1815 that sailors on the Clyde first heard the chuffing of a steamship. She clattered past their doomed craft. And as they peered out from under their canvas, it must have seemed that sail would go out of business overnight. But actually, it wasn't quite as simple as that. Bye. Marvel, why don't you, at the wonderful hot thing between my legs? After a bit of marveling, they started to laugh. All that steam may look nice, but it's no way to run a business. The little engine was incredibly inefficient and simply ran out of steam before it got anywhere near the horizon. Yes, well, you see, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed now. Your main problem with this kind of engine uh, really is that, I mean, to get this, we're on the Bonnie Banks au Loch Lomond. To get from this end to that end, you would probably have to refill the boiler about three or four times and stoke up the, um, the fire about five or six times. And really, to go any distance in this boat, there would be room for the engine, moi, and enough coal and water to get you there. So if Auntie Betty hands in a wee scoot along Loch Lomond, you'd have to say, no. And so when the single-cylinder steam engine took to the water in 1815, it really didn't create much of a splash at all. What with all the taps, pipes, coal and water, it was no match commercially for the sailing ship, who, of course, were running on fresh air. Also, they needed constant attention, or things could get somewhat embarrassing in the boiler department. It's all a bit worrying, of course, if, it, uh, <laughs> if there's no water, it's um, more of a bomb than a boiler, really. Interestingly enough. Why are you all drifting away from me? Why, why is the camera... Boys, um, no, boys, I mean, I can fix it. I mean, it won't, when I say it could turn from a boiler into a bomb, I mean, it, it's possible, it's not. You'll, you'll come and get me, though, wouldn't you? Boys. Help! Oh, jinx. 
Well, there you have it. It's a lovely little thing, the single cylinder steam engine, but not, I'm afraid, very efficient. And here's why. See, what happens is this. There's your cylinder, and there's your piston. Right? Steam comes in here, in the inlet valve, and the pressure pushes the piston down, of course. That's how the whole thing works. Like that, pressure, pressure, pressure. Then when it comes back up, of course, having done its work, it comes back up to the top. And what happens then, of course, is that the steam is forced out here. It then goes straight up the lum and out to the atmosphere. So it is completely wasted. So, necessity being the mother of invention, this is what they came up with. Why not have three cylinders? Start off with a tiny wee cylinder that takes the very high pressure. It does its business. It comes out. It goes on to a medium-sized piston. It has to be slightly bigger because it's expanding. That's why it's called the triple expansion engine. One, two, triple. It then goes out of this one, the medium-sized one, into the enormous one and pushes that one down so that you've not wasted any steam. Now, this is a massive breakthrough because although those little single cylinder babies could chuff up and down the lakeside with the parasols and they were awfully fun, you really needed something with this kind of reliability and something that didn't waste the steam if you were going to cross the Atlantic. It was probably the most important engine of its time. And it wasn't really a, a can of beans that drove it. I was just being symbolic there, you know. Here we are on the SS Shield Hull. It's the largest triple expansion screw driven coaster running in the world. It was great big filthy buggers like this that really got the Empire on the move. With its two thumping great 800 horsepower triple expansion Lovnitz engines, this was a baby that could go places. But despite her heroic looks, the SS Shield Hall's place was firmly at the bottom end of the Empire. Built in Renfrew 1954 to a 1920s design because the diesels were always breaking down. It was built to carry what's known as treated waste which, uh, well, basically jobbies to you and me. And they used to take them out into the client and just drop them, which is why in large they have sealed windows. And there you have it. There's your triple expansion engine. Transmogrifying, whatever the word is. It's completely mesmeric. I'm surprised people don't fall in and get crushed to death. The steam comes into the tiny wee piston at enormous pressure. Pushes the piston down, the piston comes up, the steam escapes into this medium-sized piston. It's not under as much pressure, but it's expanded. So the fact that it's a medium-sized piston means that you still get the same amount of effort out of it. Steam pushes the piston down, the piston comes back up, transfers the steam along to our huge piston. By this time, you're down to about eight pounds a square inch. But because it's over such a huge area and it's expanding, you get the same amount of force. It's not often in the world of engineering that a picture so graphically tells the story. You've got a high pressure, a medium pressure, and a low pressure. You can see that's 75. There you're sitting about 18, and that's at about eight. Now, the reason there's a vacuum on this side is that the last drop of steam is being sucked out the end, sent upstairs and condensed back into water. The triple expansion engine was the one that finally blew away the sailing ship. Suddenly it was possible to set off knowing what day you would arrive, whether that meant Danoon or Durban. It was also possible to make the journey economically, allowing plenty of room on board for steam locomotives so you could travel inland once you reached the continent of your choice. It was a truly brilliant idea. What I really love about ideas like this is that when you see them, you imagine that left in the desert island with 20,000 pages of white paper and a pencil, you would come up with it yourself. And uh, 
that's the sort of nonsensical illusion that keeps us interested in machinery, because of course that wouldn't happen really. They've just told me a very physical engineering secret about this ship, where you can get hot water to make a cup of tea. Well, you've got to get your priorities right, haven't you? By the time the triple expansion steam engine was at its peak, it could carry one tonne of cargo one mile on the equivalent energy released from burning one sheet of Victorian writing paper. Now that's what I call engineering. Well, there you go then. Last sight of land before you hit the Cape. Picture it. A couple of big, beautiful North British steam locomotives welded to your necks. Down below, two big triple expansion engines whizzing round the old screws and frothing the sea. 200 pounds a square inch in the boilers. Good old steam. <sighs> no sugar, McTavish! How many times? When Cecil Rhodes became Prime Minister of the Cape Colony in 1890, his dream was to build a railway from the Cape to Cairo, running like a British vein through the African veldt. It's a truly heroic notion, if for some slightly dubious reasons, but there's one thing for sure, it couldn't have happened without steam. There is a certain sort of Scotsman, and I naturally am not one of them, who, after a couple of drinks, will claim that James Watt invented the steam engine and you're doing pretty well if you can get away with it. However, Watt's engine was not designed to move. If you're talking about locomotives, locomotion, you're talking about Trevithick and then Stevenson, of course. The layout is very, very basic, but it works beautifully and it never really changed, except they just got a teensy weensy bit larger. This is what you can do with a triple expansion engine. You can drag these monsters all the way from Manchester, where they were built, to open up a continent. I bet old Stevenson didn't imagine that happening. This is a Bar Peacock Garrett. It's a very rare and beautiful engine. You'll notice something's gone apparently horribly wrong with the layout of the wheels. This is a 464 464. The reason for this is the traction it gives you. It gives you a fantastic pulling power. And also, the two big bogies are articulated, so it can go around windy little tracks, of which there are many in Africa. These big British beasts are still in daily use, here at the amusingly named Wanky Colliery, along with several other old British locals shunting thousands of tons of coal up and down the horseshoe curve from the mine to the local plant. But despite their Jurassic appearance, they're actually not all that old. Funny to look at things like this and realize I used to go to school with things like this, and yet now it seems like something out of a completely different era. It looks like a dinosaur, really. I mean, a very attractive dinosaur, of course. The kind of dinosaur you'd like to take to dinner and buy an expensive frock and hope that someday after a week or two it would gaze at you that wonderful, please, I love you, take me way, or, or am I talking about something else? No, it's a train, it's definitely, well, it's not a train, it's a locomotive. You must never, ever call it a train. Guys in Anorak will beat you to death on the spot. There is complete logic to these engines surviving out here. Firstly, there's no shortage of coal in Zimbabwe. Secondly, they build all their own spare parts, so no waiting for the second post to bring that vital piston from Germany. And thirdly, in a country this size, no one is that concerned about a bit of black smoke. Beautiful. Thank <laughs> you. 
best view in the world. My God. Although it looks complicated, the steam locomotive is essentially quite simple. It's exactly the same layout as the tiny single cylinder boat. Fire, boiler, steam, piston. Only the boiler had to be long and thin, otherwise you wouldn't get through the tunnels. And driving it is fairly straightforward. The really important thing is that your water level, if that gets very low, you're in really deep doo-doo. Your, your pressure, the state of your fire. There's the brake over there. And this is the, the regulator. The regulator is just a huge valve that lets the steam into the piston. Steamies to the left of them, steamies to the right of them. Oh, what a time they had. Despite the fact that these engines are in daily use, their numbers have dwindled since the heyday of the empire. The steam sheds at Bulawayo used to service hundreds of locos, but now it's dropped to around a dozen. The main problem is keeping these beasts going. Since no one manufactures them anymore, new parts are hard to come by which makes maintenance a highly regular task. I made myself useful. This is how you reinsert a piston in a steam engine. All pretty straightforward, if you happen to be built by Elspeth McNulty. <laughs> yeah, it's always that. It's always the one nearest. There's no bloody room in it, is it? <laughs> always the one. You never use. You never use sockets in these, I suppose, do you? You're lucky my mother's not here. She'd be sprinting down the workshop. <laughs> My God, they're back, she'd be screaming. <laughs> it was delightfully straightforward putting the loco back together again, like some huge Meccano set. But for these engineers, it's nothing special. There are guys here who've worked on trains all their lives and never sully their hands on a diesel. I declare this piston rod connected. <laughs> Business, okay? But while all this Mancunian metal was all well and good, there was something sorely missing. Many of the engines that once worked in Zimbabwe came from Glasgow, and yet there'd be precious little sign of anything Scottish. I needn't have worried. Engine number 190 was built by the North British Company in the Queen's Park Works in Glasgow. She was one of a consignment of 20 engines ordered by the Rhodesian Railways Company to work the mainline service between Bulawayo and the Victoria Falls. And she arrived somewhat majestically in Africa on a triple expansion engine steamer in April 1926. The reason the steam locomotive never developed in quite the same technical way as the ship's engine was that there was really no need. Once you're on dry land, your problems evaporate. You simply build your watering and coaling stations as and when you need them and employ some of the local talent to do the work. We're just about ready to go. So, with full tanks and bunkers and a good head of steam in the boiler, we were off for one of the enduring landmarks of the Empire, the Victoria Falls Bridge.
Engine 190 has a good few miles under her wheels, and things aren't quite as reliable as they used to be. With less than 50 miles to go to the falls, the engineers noticed that one of the axle boxes was running hot. On any other service, they'd simply arrange for a bus transfer, but here, they get on with a job. What they needed to do was to raise the middle axle, knock in some steel wedges, and ease the weight off the bearing. But how? You don't want to know. He's putting sand down to make sure it doesn't slip as it goes. You could live a hundred years and not see a running repair like this. I wasn't sure whether we were privileged or in mortal danger. But we were back in business and heading full steam ahead for the falls. It's a bittersweet moment, this great lump of Scottish metal on an English bridge over a waterfall named after a British monarch in the middle of someone else's country. But whatever the politics, you don't need to be embarrassed by the engineering. Being here doesn't half make you appreciate the ingenuity of the mechanical mind. Set it a task and soon enough it comes up with a solution. The fact that the steam engine still runs in these parts proves what an enduring idea it was. It is a testament to an age when things were built to last, an idea as sensible as it is romantic. You know, it's like a woman, really. You've got to look after them all the time. But you want to keep the pressure going in the relationship. They've got to be tended to every five minutes. In fact, if this engine was a lady, I'd marry it. I'm not really Jeremy Clarkson. I was just pretending. <laughs>